Hello and welcome to the Found Cause. We're Found Our Cause and Serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Michael, the man behind the machine, and to my right, your left is Sebastian, the bookkeeper. Hey, Sebastian, how's it going? I am doing great, Michael. I have a joke for you. Another joke. So this is part two, by the way. So we we were the same city. <laughs> What's the second joke? Another one you've looked up online. How lame! I would never look up a joke online. Okay, give it to me. Where's the first tennis match mentioned in the Bible? Yeah, I don't know. When Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. <laughs> got it, huh? Court, Joseph. <laughs> I got it, totally. All right, I got a joke for you now right. that I did not look up. Definitely not. Uh, who is the first drug addict in the Bible? We're getting edgy here in the Found Gods. Who? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He was on grass for seven years. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you might not be thinking that those are relevant at all. They kind of aren't, but we need a better intro than me, like staring at a camera or whatever else we do. So today's episode is part two of man versus God. Who is sovereign? God versus man, whatever we're going to call it. This is part two because in the first part, we talked about the New Testament and how God's plan of salvation and the coming of Jesus and all that he does is sovereign. This is going to be part two, going back into the Old Testament and showing how it's the same God, consistent God. He was God in the New Testament. He's God in the Old Testament. And so his personality has not changed. He's still sovereign. The way he does things is still sovereign. He does what he wants and he does not let man's will overcome his will. Um, so first things first, Sebastian, for those who didn't watch part one or are forgotten, you know, it's been a while. What is the definition of sovereignty or how would we talk about this what's what's god's sovereignty even mean mm -hmm. supreme authority or power and really unconstrained by any by anything yes so when we say sovereignty sovereignty to god in case you're forgetting or haven't thought about it before it means that god like i said isn't affected by other people's actions opinions. i mean he might choose to do things based on them but he's not for his hand is not forced he does what he wants and when he plans to do something it's never thwarted Okay, so there are Christians that definitely dispute that. And so we want to talk about it not only from the Christian perspective, but of course, we're testified to anybody who wants to know about God, whether you're Christian or not. This is the way God of the Bible shows himself to be. So the first thing we want to show Sebastian is that it is the same God, because there are many scholars and just Christians in general who either aren't well, well read or they're just intentionally defying the the bible and they say that the old testament god is an old meanie he doesn't like gay people he puts people to death he exterminated the people of canaan and he's always asking for sacrifices and so he's totally a mean god but jesus and the god of the new testament that's a, a neato god he's all about loving your enemies and um, turning the other cheek and so these two gods are fundamentally different how would you respond to that i would say what are you talking about that would be my first reaction to me. Wow, very strong. I go, my eyebrows are shinged off. What are you talking about? Okay, you know, gonna have to be some diplomatic with our uh, brothers and sisters who may be l less well versed in the Bible. Okay. Normally, see, that's 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 an attack right there. It comes from lack of proper understanding of the Old Testament. Simply, I think it's lack of exposure and just you know getting what you were told in Sunday school or whatnot. Hence, why I'm making. My kids at my church, not my actual just people, yes, children, but just, you know, the with, kids yeah. I teach, yes, go through Old Testament prophecy and how it relates to the new, because I think it's important. It's God is the same. There's as much death, destruction, explosion, whatever you want to call it in the Old Testament as in the new, as we have also throughout our episodes, we've talked about that just as much as there is love, mercy and compassion in the New Testament as in the old. Yep. I can think of Jonah right away when he complains to God, why did you send me there? I knew you were a merciful and compassionate God. I knew you would not destroy this Ninevites. I wanted you to kill them all, but I'm paraphrasing here, but he showed mercy and compassion. Again, it's just one example. You can look at more. I encourage everyone to preach love and compassion from the Old Testament just to mix things up a bit. Point is, God is the same in the old and in the new. It's the same God, hasn't changed. So with that said, if you watch our first part, we talked about how God was sovereign, not only over the events of history, but also over the salvation of his people in the New Testament, as evidenced by quotes we gave from the scripture in the New Testament. But we also want to talk and show God's sovereignty over the events of history in the Old Testament. One of the most famous examples of this, again, there's plenty. You can go across the entire history of the Old Testament and see God's hand in different things, affecting people's lives, not being affected by the strivings of men, obviously all powerful over all things and doing what he accomplished or what he planned to accomplish from the beginning, despite people's 
plans and intentions. One of the most famous examples is from Genesis. So, Sebastian, do you want to bring up um, Joseph's talk about what his brothers are doing? Sure. So, yes, yes, we did talk about in the in the pre in the previous episode how it's important to have you know proper understanding of God's sovereignty, so that if you're in a time of difficulty, how how can you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Hence, why and then I alluded to this spot-on example on someone who was abused and then he actually is given a revelation by God of why he went through all that pain and suffering which was for ultimate good again God is in the background he is he's not just sitting there in the background actually he is well he's not in person with Joseph he is leading the situation for a goal with a goal in mind so this is from Genesis 45 this is when, after the brothers, they meet Joseph. They, they don't recognize him, but now he reveals himself to them. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, and then it goes on. Yep. And I think a famous line from that that's not there. I, when you brought that up before the podcast, I was like, that doesn't sound like the quote that I know, but it's because it comes in Genesis 50. Um, Joseph reiterates what he had said to his brothers. He says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Um, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That's the, the quote I knew. So again, in summary, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, attempted, they wanted to murder him, they ended up not doing it, um, but but this whole thing was intended by God for good from the outset, right? So it wasn't a thing that God had to deal with once it happened and try to make something good out of it. No, it was intended by God for good. Again, a confirming prophecy, like there was going to be famine that was going to force the Israelites out. Um, so God prepared a place for the Israelites in Egypt, not only because they were going to need the food, but also because that's the way God wanted to write the story. Like God is also sovereign over famine. So not only is he sovereign over the famines, but also where the people live and the whole way the story plays out. So it grew Joseph's faith. Um, it established them in Egypt as a powerful dynasty, you could say. And of course, it saved the lives of those people. So that shows that God is sovereign over the events of history from famines to where people move to the individual lives of stories of, of individual people um, and as you were saying sebastian another key element to this as we talked about in part one is that it's a terrible evil thing that the brothers did to joseph but god intended it for good for joseph's good and for of course his own glory we know from the new testament just to steal from it for a second that these who love god now um, that god has called according to his purposes all things work together for their good so when you suffer things that in your life or you see others going through things that they themselves are Christians, know that God's sovereignty is not done away with just because something evil is happening to Christians. Um, those evil things that are happening to Christians are guaranteed, promised by God to be something for those Christians' benefit. So God's word promise. Yes. Keep in mind that we're not guaranteed, we're not promised by God himself to know, to get the revelation of why we're going through that. We do get a snippet of an occasion, a clear example, I would say. Joseph did get the revelation from God. He, mm -hmm. God explained to him um, exactly how, you know, could be through images or whatnot, or just by wisdom. This is exactly why this happened. We might not get the benefit of that, but knowing, understanding who God is, who Jesus Christ is, we can have peace in knowing that even though we're going through the difficulty and we might not be guaranteed exactly why we're going through that you can have peace with God. This is important to understand and for you to study on your own before you get a, before you get, as we say, cancer, before mm -hmm. you suffer physical, sexual, or verbal abuse, before you're m murdered or you know attempted attempted murder, before you go through some stressful situation. It is important to get down and understand, have the, your internal peace with and, and be in communication with God. Understand that He is sovereign. He works all things for our good, for His people, and. That is when he's, he's trustworthy. And another example, I would say, perhaps you might get into it, Michael. Mm -hmm. Job. 
there, there was yeah. there's a lot of backstory mm-hmm. be, with what everything that happens to Job, but he unlike Joseph, he doesn't really get the behind the scenes of why it happened. Yeah, uh, so Job, famous example. If you read all of Job, you'll see all these these things bad ha- things happen to Job, right? God allows them to happen. In fact, as Satan comes and asks to do them, and God gives permission expressly. So we know that Job's suffering is expressly seen and allowed by God. And then Job is stalwart for the most part. His friends are telling him to curse God, and, and many other reasons. Some of them are telling him not to curse God. And eventually, Job does ask, you know, why have you done this to me, God? Because I haven't done anything wrong. And so God's response to Job isn't a big explanation like oh i wanted to test your faith and satan came up to me he didn't give any of that explanation god does a multi-chapter um rants essentially of saying who are you to ask me what i'm doing and what you know why i would do certain things like you're just a man or do you know the way that uh like the ox gives birth or were you there at the foundation of the world so if you want to read it yourself i'd highly recommend the ending of job the last couple of chapters of job if you want to see god's claim to sovereignty and and the littleness of men but we as men aren't owed anything. God does not owe us anything. He's the Lord of all. Um, some atheist commenters from our episodes from Apologia response were talking about how if God was real, he owes us um, evidences so that we can see his sovereignty and see that he's truly God. And if he doesn't give us those evidences, well, then he's a wicked God and all this, whatever. Um, God, the sovereign God doesn't owe us anything. And if we've sinned against him, all the less does he owe us anything, right? He owes us damnation. He owes us judgment. So if you want a view of that God, well, then read the ending of Job and say, that. Uh, another example of God not only affecting individuals, but also affecting whole nations is what he does to Assyria. I mean, he does it to every nation today, too. He's sovereign over the United States. He's in charge. He owns what happens in the United States, whether we live or die, succeed or fail. Um, but in the Bible, there's samples, many judgments on nations and then bringing up of nations. But one mm-hmm. famous example is for Assyria. Yes. And also God shows his ability to mind, to do mind reading, too, in this in the same passage and explain he gives us the benefit of explaining why he's carrying out his judgment. Mm-hmm. In Isaiah 10, Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against a people who anger me to seize loot and snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. But this is not what he intends. This is not what he has in mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations skip all the names of the nations for the sake of of summary Mm -hmm. and when the lord has finished all his work against mount zion and jerusalem he will say i will punish the king of assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes for he says by my strength by the strength of my hand i have done this and by my wisdom because i have understanding then god will say after uh, afterwards after he the king of Assyria prides himself. Does the axe raise itself above the person who swings it, or the saw boast against the one who uses it? As if a rod were to wield the person who lifts it up, or a club brandish the one who is not wood. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors. Under his pomp, a fire will be kindled like a blazing flame. So if you're not familiar with the history, Assyria, a great nation of the ancient past, they come and God is saying he's using them to not only completely destroy Israel, in case you're not familiar with the history, completely, Assyria comes and completely destroys the northern tribes of Israel, deports them just like the Babylonians eventually do to the Judean kingdom. Um, and then the Assyrians also invade Judah. So they're not spared the destruction that comes from the Assyrians. But God is saying, Yes, he's using the Assyrians to do to accomplish a task, to destroy Israel, to punish them, and to punish even Judea. But Assyria is not meaning to follow God in doing that. They're meaning to destroy many nations and plunder and loot and do whatever they want. So God is also going to punish them for doing something that God was using them for, but it was still with a wicked heart. So there you see that God is not subject to human standards of justice, like some atheists or other Christians might argue that God can't punish somebody for doing something that he made them do. God is making the Assyrians go and punish Israel and Judah, but they also have evil hearts, and so he punishes them for that as well. There's no um, dissonance there between those two objects. Yes, when the king of Syria is going, as you're saying, Michael, he's not th- he's not thinking to himself, God is good, the Israelites are bad, he's telling me to go destroy them. He's mm-hmm. like, I want to kill them because I want to be the owner of the whole world. Yep, pretty much. Again, and same exception, an example we mentioned in the New Testament, Herod, 
Pontius Pilate, Judas, the 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 Sadducees and Pharisees, mm -hmm. they all had their own intentions, but God was using their evil intentions. Who they 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 would gladly, you know, do what they did for their own benefit, for the sake of killing Christ on the cross for our redemption. So God right. uses evil for a good for a for a good result. Yep. And I think one thing that we shouldn't take for granted, I know that I have taken it for granted in my past, but there are, there are those who disagree with it, especially atheists, but also fellow Christians who who claim this is not the case. Some of them are called open theists, whatever. Um, this point is key. God knows the future. How does God know the future? He knows the future because he makes things happen, right? The future doesn't actually exist right now. So it's not like he can time travel into the future or maybe I... I I mean, I guess he can do whatever he wants, but I would argue that the future doesn't exist. It hasn't happened yet. It's like the past doesn't exist because it also has already happened, right? All that exists is the present. However, God can know the future because he is in control of everything that happens right now that leads up to the future. So the only way oh. prophecy can happen, the only way that God can predict that things will happen and then have them happen is for him to be sovereign, to be in control of everything so that those things are accomplished. Because if he wasn't in control, maybe those things don't turn out the way he wanted. For example, the crucif crucifixion of Jesus, right? If God wasn't actively involved things may pan out differently than he was intending and so then the prophecy wouldn't become true so the only way prophecy works is if god not only knows the future but is in charge of what happens today so that the future can be accomplished that way and we've got a quote from isaiah talking about god's knowledge yes yes and isaiah 46 let me also add if god was bounded by time that will make time greater than god well, yeah, he's not within. I mean, he, he he can enter time just like he did as Jesus and enters time with us. No, I mean, if he us. has to react to time to events in yes. time, mm -hmm. but whereas he decrees time, yeah, for events to unfold. And then here here here's where we get this from from Isaiah forty six. Remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there's none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times. What is still to come? I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Mm -hmm. And so we've got God knowing the future. We've got God being sovereign over all things. We've got God being sovereign over suffering. In the Old Testament, we've talked about it in the news well. I think the last thing that we should get point across from today is that yes it's a consistent god via the old testament and the new testament um, but one thing that's especially apparent in the old testament is that we should fear god and i don't just mean fears and be afraid although i sometimes we should be afraid of his like genuinely afraid like trembling afraid of his judgment and justice because his justice is perfect which means it completely destroys the wicked and has great punishment for those who not only hurt their fellow brothers and sisters and you know, humanity or hurt the earth or whatever else might be, but also those who sin against God, considering God is the ultimate, um, there's ultimate punishment for those. So we should fear God as in fear him. We should also fear God as in respecting him for his great power. A great example of this, somebody who is cowed, somebody who was um, <laughs> great and then had to admit and submit to God is the King Nebuchadnezzar from the Bible. Great king of Babylon, historical king, real king, um, comes crazy in his end. And in Daniel, it shows when he comes to, when he comes out of his craziness, he submits to God. Do you have that? Ready? I do. Yes. And this is a one that's not often quoted, but here is from Daniel 4. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. That's why I like that the cow. He was yep. cowed. Yep. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. What a sight. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward the heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. And it goes on. And again, you could find that kind of language all over the Old Testament. So it's not the only example. There's plenty, if like I mentioned before, Job, standing in Job, if you want to see just straight God ranting and showing his sovereignty, Job, Isaiah, chapters 40 through 48, 
or the trials of the false gods and all that stuff we quoted from the portion of it um, there's plenty of god fearing passages in the old testament believe it or not it's kind of what it's famous for so i think that's the the end goal of god's sovereignty is fearing god and therefore submitting to him repenting to god and being saved because our ultimate hope is in jesus christ hiding us from god's perfect justice in his perfect mercy so any that are listening and haven't yet turned to christ we we implore you come to christ because his judgment and wrath is hard it says in um, one of the psalms kiss the son lest he be angry right so kiss jesus that has come and submit to jesus christ lest he be angry because his wrath is kindled and he's ready to destroy the wicked because he's just so we are all wicked and you have to turn to christ be saved any last closing thoughts on this sebastian god's sovereignty no, no. We, we we've gone over everything remember this is important because to just to wrap up what we talked in the two episodes this affects how you understand salvation and the sacrifice of christ it also affects how we evangelize which by the way we are commanded to evangelize you might say let's just be lazy and not talk to anybody because god will bring people okay yes but as as jesus jesus commands us to go and make disciples of all peoples of the earth one and then paul says how will they believe if no if no one goes to 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 teach them to mm -hmm. preach to them okay again we are we sh as as believers we should submit to god and realize use us as instruments to reach out for the love that you have for your people for your your for those who are lost and also move give us that love and compassion so that we can also reach out to them so we can be your tools to reach out to them we're instruments of god Okay, that, that being said, affects evangelism. Then, when you have crisis in your life, understand that God uses evil for the benefit of his people, his sheep, his flock. Then, we went over here for the Old Testament. He is consistent. He, he doesn't have a change personality or whatnot. The same in the Old, same in the New Testament. And... What is ultimately leads down to is fear of God, which is proper, respectful fear. And also, well, if you if you don't repent and believe in him, it should be, you know, actual fear. So Yep. So in that we found our cause in serving that very Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening. I've been Michael the Man Behind the Machine. To my right, your left has been Sebastian the Bookkeeper. If you want to see the rest of our episodes, you can go to youtube.com if you're not already there and search of Found Cause and see all of our episodes there in video. We're also on facebook.com forward slash found cause. But if you want to see all of our audio only episodes, you can download them at foundcause.podbead.com and you can download them all also on your other podcast listening places, whether it's iTunes or Spotify or wherever you do your podcast. So until next time, when we talk about something completely different, I think we'll do a reaction video. So usually mm -hmm. what we do. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.